So I think we have a critical mass now, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, as I said before, my name is Felicia Pullum from CBP, and we're moving into the industry presentation phase of our day. So we'll hear from each presenter for 15 minutes, and then have a 10-minute opportunity for questions. So the two standing microphones right there in the aisles um, are to ask the questions. So please feel free to get up and, and you know, get, it, get in a queue uh, to start asking your questions when the time comes. Um, but we'll also have someone walking around with a microphone in case you're unable to come to, to the standing mics. If we run out of time, I would encourage you to please see our event support team, some, someone wearing a green uh, lanyard in the rotunda, to ask your question so that we can follow up and make sure you get an answer. So then finally, as we move into the presentations, I want to share a brief disclaimer. We have a much longer disclaimer here on, on the, so the screens, um, but in short, the purpose of this event is to provide information and a platform for sharing across the private sector. CBP is not endorsing any particular technology or technology provider. So thank you again for joining us today. We're really excited and appreciative that you chose to spend the day with us. Um, and now I'm gonna introduce our first presenter. So uh, I'd like to introduce Mr. Kit Conklin. He's a vice president at the research and data analytics firm, Caron. He leads engagement with Caron's government clients and works with global corporations and financial institutions on forced labor, sanctions, and supply chain risk. Kit is also a senior fellow with the Atlantic Council's Geotechnology Center. Prior to Caron, Kit served in multiple national security positions with the U.S. government. He has lived in Beijing and worked on China for more than 15 years. Um, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. My name is Kit Conklin. Uh, my background is in the intelligence community, and today I'll be discussing Caron. Um, you can think about us as a research and data company, certainly, but in reality, we're an intelligence company. We specialize in detecting risks within global supply chains. And I think before we show any of the technology itself, it's useful to start a bit more about our analytical trade craft. How do we detect forced labor? What is the intelligence process that we utilize to create this data? And then I'll discuss a bit more about how we work with a lot of the partners and companies actually in this room. Um, we are a complement to a lot of the supply chain mapping companies that are out there. Um, and we can uh, answer any questions that you may have on that. But to start, let me, I think, contextualize a bit about the UFLPA in general. We had some great presentations this morning that discussed the background on the law. How do we get here? What is the rebuttable presumption? Um, now, I want to discuss where that law and due diligence intersect. So forced labor networks, when we think about detecting these types of risks within global supply chains, they don't just exist randomly only in Xinjiang. It's global in nature, right? There is no de minimis requirement or threshold uh, for a UFLPA detention. So if you've got 0.1% of your commodity that contains elements or inputs that were made with forced labor, you could be subject to a detention. So how do you actually detect that risk? Um, a lot of people uh, kind of forget, right, that CBP has been very prolific with respect to FAQs and due diligence best practices and how to actually detect this risk. So we at Caron use that government-provided risk uh, thresholds for our, our analysis. So we've got a team of researchers, uh, dozens of analysts, they speak Chinese, uh, and they spend all day every day looking at open source information to map out the risks associated with forced labor uh, typologies and indicators. Um, we use primary source information to do this. So we don't have anybody in China. Uh, we don't have anybody looking at these issues inside of factories in Xinjiang and other provinces in China. Everything that we do from an intelligence perspective is using human analysts to find open source information about the risk typologies that CBP has published. So let me spend a bit of time talking about that. Um, CBP, I think, gets, gets hit hard sometimes by those in industry 
for not telling us more about where the risk is. And I would, I would disagree with that. I think fundamentally CBP and the Xinjiang Supply Chain Business Advisory originally published in 2020, that guidance was updated in 2021, and now the due diligence best practices have been incorporated both into the UFLPA and subsequent guidance from CBP. It's been very specific about what companies should look for within global supply chains that cause risk. So let's dive into these for just a few minutes. The typologies and warning signs here are from that government guidance. This is the roadmap for every UFL compliance, UFLPA compliance program. You have to conduct that research. You have to identify where forced labor risk is per these typologies. So I mentioned that because we at Caron use this as the North Star, as the starting point for all of the work that we do when we're trying to detect this risk. So what does this mean? It means, for example, identifying companies that are co-located with prisons. So how do you do that? You first have to start by identifying all of the prisons, all of the internment camps, all of the re-education centers, and then from there, using satellite imagery, using other sources of open source intelligence, from there you identify what are those companies that are operating inside of that internment camp, inside of that re-education center. What are the companies that are located along the fence of that internment camp or that prison? Where are those laborers that are imprisoned in that facility going to work for 12 hours a day? And then once you identify those companies, it's a matter of following those supply chains regardless of what the commodity is globally. So as you follow that risk, traditionally what will happen, if it's a, if it's a raw material, if it's silica, if it's cotton, if it's anything else, lithium, aluminum, it doesn't matter. We'll follow all of those products as they enter the supply chain inside of China. So products manufactured in whole or in part, it may be a prison, and then it's sold to another company in China. Other inputs are added, a widget is created, raw material is turned into a whole product, and then maybe it's exported to Vietnam or Indonesia or Mexico. We follow that research wherever it takes us. The other starting points for our work are also outlined here. So co companies co-located with prisons, one typology. Other things that CBP has regularly and consistently highlighted as being representative of risk, things like the Mutual Pairing Assistance Program. So these are, again, starting points for our research. We're going to determine where are those companies that have received government subsidies to create new factories, to manufacture or mine new products in Xinjiang, and then from there, that same typology, following those supply chains. Same with other typologies. Um, frequently, government and industry kind of thinks about the UFLPA risks from the perspective of only looking at inputs from Xinjiang. Well, that's not, that's not sophisticated. So we have to think about this from the perspective of the other warning signs that CBP has publicly highlighted. Labor transfers are the big one. So what this means is if you've got a company that is receiving labor transfers, ethnic Uyghurs, Kazakhs, Turks, other ethnic minorities being involuntarily moved from their homes in Xinjiang and forced to work at other factories, maybe in Guangzhou, Shanghai, other provinces, other cities in China, anything at that facility is now tainted with forced labor risk. So as you're thinking about due diligence and as you're thinking about uh, structuring your program, you need to ensure that you have intelligence on those actors located not just in Xinjiang, but globally that are connected back into these typologies. Um, from our perspective, though, at Caron, when we provide our forced labor data for companies to screen against, to utilize in supply chain mapping solutions to include some of the great partners that we have here today, uh, the first thing that we're going to look at is understanding the ownership associated with that risk. So imagine these red circles at the top of the screen. Maybe they're a company that's located at a prison. Or maybe they're a company that's received a labor transfer. Or maybe they're a company that's engaged in the cotton or silica trade. The first thing that we're going to do is map out that ownership. And then El Nagar earlier made a really great and interesting point that I want to highlight here. We at Caron also follow these networks as they evolve. So ownership changes regularly. We see this all of the time. Front companies, shell companies, companies that have been added to the UFLP entity list or have been publicly associated by the great work that Sheffield does and Laura Murphy's team does. Once a company is publicly identified with these types of networks, they don't just stop. 
there is evasion activity that takes place. So one element of our data that we provide is following these companies as ownerships change, as divestments change, as front companies pop up, obfuscating the source of that risk. Um, we'll also look upstream. This is a very, very common typology to understand and identify where, for example, companies are owned by the Xinjiang Prisons Administration. For those that may not know, the Xinjiang Prisons Administration is a government body. They exert control along with the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps over almost all of the prisons and uh, re-education centers in Xinjiang. So why does that matter? It matters because if you're looking upstream for a company in Shanghai, it's possible that there will be exposure to the Xinjiang government officials that are responsible for uh, prosecuting what the United Nations has described as a genocide in the country. So you have to think about this risk holistically. Um, the next piece that we at Caron will follow are control relationships. So if you're thinking about the UFLPA only from a beneficial ownership perspective, it's, it's not as sophisticated as you could, you could be doing it. So another way that we at Caron map out this risk is by understanding, for example, intelligence that will never show up in corporate records. Looking, for example, at those companies and organizations that are owned or controlled by government officials, understanding other risk typologies, like, for example, operating units of the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. These are not a publicly available pieces of intelligence that are only in corporate records. You have to dive into very difficult to find sources of intelligence to map out these risks and then figure out from there where the source of that risk ties back into a typology that CBP has outlined. Another element of what we do, perhaps a bit beyond the scope of the discussion today, is we take data on who is investing in these companies. So if you're a US bank, a US private equity company, uh, if you're in VC and you're looking to invest in startups or perhaps publicly traded firms in China, we help folks navigate where that debt, where those securities, where those equities are that are tied back into the publicly traded entities in China that use forced labor. Because at the end of the day, it's not just privately held companies that use forced labor. Thousands of companies in China are affiliated with UFLPA risk, many of which are publicly traded. Um, but I want to spend a bit more time talking about the typologies that CBP has outlined that we at Caron use as our guiding point for the research that we conduct. So prison supply chains, I briefly discussed this, but here's an example of put on, uh, remove the compliance hat, remove the supply chain procurement hat, remove that council hat that you may be wearing, and think about this from the perspective of an enforcement. So how or why is a good detain at the border? Um, Many in industry regularly ask CBP this question, and CBP, for all sorts of logical reasons, is not going to be able to always provide publicly information about why a good has or hasn't been uh, detained. So here's an example just to make this a bit more real. So if you've got, for example, a prison supply chain, so as a reminder, that's a company that's co-located at a prison, you have to understand as the, as the source of that risk enters the global supply chain, it's traditionally not coming into the United States or coming into Vietnam directly from Xinjiang. It's going to intermediary companies, tier twos, threes, from the risk itself. So we at Caron map that risk out using, again, humans. We don't have AI, we don't use lots of big data. We use humans that are intelligence analysts that speak Chinese to conduct this research. So we'll follow the risks from the supply chain connected in uh, a prison, and then we'll follow that risk globally. So earlier today, CBP announced the dashboard. If you look at the dashboard, huge volumes of CBP detentions have been in Southeast Asia countries. Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam. Why? How? It's because these products are made in prison supply chains and other typologies that CBP has publicly identified, and then they're being exported to these third countries and then being shipped in the United States. So if you're thinking about why a product from Vietnam is being detained, it's because there could be some risk tied back into, for example, prison supply chains. But there's other risk typologies. And this is the one that we get asked about the most, mutual pairing assistance. This is not a term that Caron made up, and it's not a term that CBP decided randomly to incorporate in their due diligence best practices for industry. This is a term that's used by the Chinese government to help companies, help companies in China uh, receive government subsidies 
to manufacture and create new um, satellite factories in, in Xinjiang that then use forced labor uh, to manufacture goods, components, or, or widgets. So what does that actually mean? It means, for example, maybe you have a publicly traded company, maybe it's in Xinjiang, maybe it's not in Xinjiang, but they will receive government incentives to utilize ethnic laborers, and then from that point, you now have tainted supply chains that are, again, global in nature. They don't necessarily need to only be in Xinjiang themselves. Um, the next typology that I'll spend a bit of time discussing is labor transfers. Another key typology that we have to spend a huge amount of time trying to identify. If you Google companies that have been affiliated with labor transfers, there's been some great work done highlighting these, but there's a lot of information that is still uh, out there that's able to be defined. Um, and we at Caron specialize in detecting these types of labor transfers. So what does this mean? It means, for example, you have a company located outside of uh, Xinjiang or maybe inside of Xinjiang that has received an ethnic uh, Uyghur, ethnic Kazakh, ethnic minority being forced to work at a factory like El Nagar and others discussed this morning um, in other provinces, right? So now you've got the UFLPA risk beyond just things associated with Xinjiang zip codes. And you've got to think about this from a strategic perspective when you're taking a risk-based approach to due diligence. Another key element that we at Caron detects, uh, detect risk, again, based on government guidance, is associated with the Xinjiang Production and Construction Corps. And this gets into the core of what I would describe as the unique nature of the UFLPA associated with sanctions risk uh, in particular. So the US government, through a variety of economic statecraft tools, export controls, sanctions, the UFLPA, the import bans, WROs historically, has used a broad set of tools to counter this type of activity, the genocide that's happening in Xinjiang. One element um, historically that was used first was sanctions. For those that, that spend time in the sanctions arena, there are very, very different legal, regulatory, and compliance uh, requirements for sanctions exposure than there is solely for UFLPA exposure. Interestingly, when it comes to the XPC guidance that CBP has publicly pushed out though, this is where the rubber meets the road. Sanctions issues and UFLPA compliance become one. And many in industry that we talk to are very concerned about incidental exposure tied back into XPC affiliates and XPCC uh, subsidiaries. Uh, there are thousands of XPCC subsidiaries. They operate hundreds of prisons and internment camps. They provide power to half of the Xinjiang economy. It is a massive paramilitary organization that should cause every compliance official um, that's concerned about these issues to, to, to raise their eyebrows. It is very difficult to find intelligence on this. It has taken us two years to use that human-derived research to holistically understand every party globally that's connected back into XPCC. And so what this means, for example, is helping clients understand and navigate where's that strict liability sanctions exposure, where's the risk tied back into XPCC affiliates from a UFLPA perspective or broader regu uh, regulatory and uh, ESG risks. Um, it, XPCC products are a big deal and it's not just cotton. So for anybody here that's just thinking about cotton, um, there are all sorts of, of other industry verticals that are relevant for XPCC. Um, the, the kind of the final typology that I want to touch on is government subsidies. So we at Caron will, again, start with that, that risk-related information that CBP has published, those typologies and warning signs, one of which is government subsidies. So we'll follow, for example, all of those companies that have re uh, received Xinjiang government subsidies for any product line. A lot of people don't know or recognize that in Xinjiang, if you are a company in China that you want to legally operate in certain industries, it is uh, almost required that you receive subsidies from the Xinjiang government. Cotton, silica, lithium, aluminum, there are others that we can discuss if you're interested. You have to have government licenses by the Xinjiang government to operate in certain segments of these fields. By mapping out all of those companies that have received those licenses, you're able to get a very clear and concise intelligence picture on where the actual risk is, for example, for a detention. 
And all of this information, regardless of what typology it's connected for, our researchers are global in nature. So we don't just think about the UFLPA from a China perspective. We have analysts that speak Korean, Vietnamese, other languages. We start with the risk, and then we follow that risk wherever it takes us. So if you're concerned about your tier ones, your tier twos, anywhere on earth, there's a good chance if there's a UFLPA risk, our analysts have looked into those networks. And so we provide this data in a couple of different ways. And this is my uh, last slide here, and I promise I'll, I'll end on time. So how do you actually get the intelligence, right? We work with nearly every company in this room. We are not competitive with the companies here. We're partners with the companies here. We work with Greg and the Oritane crew, or Grant, excuse me, and the Altana crew. We work with these folks. We provide our data for integration into these types of, of platforms. So Caron has a UI. You can subscribe to our UI and search for a single party lookup and see if there's any risk for sanctions or forced labor. But the power of the data is at scale, and it's automated. So if you have questions about our partners, we've got so many in the room with us today. Caron's data can be integrated into your existing supply chain mapping solutions, your existing denied party screening solutions, your existing internally developed solutions. Our risk data is agnostic, and we're happy to provide any additional uh, insights about who we are or what we do. But let me, let me pause there. Any questions? It. I'm sorry, I missed your presentation or the first part of it, but I've been listening in remotely. Um, Virginia from Miller and Chevalier. I've met Kit before, um, and I know that a lot of companies really rely on KR and data and use it a lot. I'm just wondering if you guys have incorporated um, information from secondary sources, like the Laura Murphy reports. So if there's an NGO report out there, companies are using Caron, can they rely on it to be able to tell them about that secondary reporting? Thanks. Yeah, good to see you again. Um, so first and foremost, I, like everyone here, should always read Laura's reports. Uh, she will be going into that tomorrow. Um, but Laura's reporting is, is it's fantastic. It's, it's top notch. We at Caron rely on primary source information. So what that means, for example, is if there is a media article, uh, if there is an NGO report, uh, we will obviously read that because it's in our uh, it's in our realm as an intelligence company to monitor those types of risks or those types of reports. As an intelligence organization, though, we are grounded in the tradecraft that we utilize inside of the intelligence community to map out this risk. So I highlight that because our methodology starts with primary source information. So our information is looking at Xinjiang government documents, looking at uh, trade information, understanding inside of primary source information, which companies have received labor transfers, which companies have received subsidies from the Xinjiang government to work in the cotton industry, or maybe operate a mine for lithium in Xinjiang. We will, we will look at that primary source information, and we will rely on that primary source information to guide our analysis. That said, uh, we, like everyone here, should be reading Laura's reports as soon as they come out. Um, they're fantastic. Any other questions? Awesome. Well, thank you all so much for your time. Oh, sorry, one more. Hi, Kate. My name's Omid. I'm uh, with Z2 Data. I believe we actually partner with yourselves, too, so thank you for that. Uh, you mentioned enforcement, and uh, this if you can answer this, that'd be great. But if not, um, you know, who does the... Uh, kind of onus fall on if I'm, let's say, an aerospace company working with a semiconductor company who I discover has uh, association, a supplier that's associated with the Xinjiang province. Um, who is that going to kind of fall on when it comes on enforcement? Are they working with me? Are they working with the semiconductor company? Uh, yeah, that'd be great to know. Thank you. I won't speak on behalf of CBP. There's a lot of good people in the room that can answer that question a lot more uh, strategically than I can. But what I will say is that the onus is on the importer, right? And the onus is on whoever provides those inputs into that 
that widget that used forced labor originally. So there could be all sorts of, of regulatory and legal requirements and ramifications for a product that's detained at the border that's got um, any percentage of inputs made with forced labor in it, right? So the folks at Miller and Chevalier and John Foote's organization, there's a whole bunch of good attorneys in the room as well that can answer that question in more strategic detail than I can. But what I will say, and then what I would, I would foot stomp, is that there's no de minimis threshold, right? So it doesn't matter if it's 0.001% of a widget or a product that's being imported in the United States is, is derived from forced labor. CBP has the authority and the mandate to block that, that, that good or that product. And so therefore it's on industry at all levels of the supply chain to ensure that the components and the inputs that are integrated into that final product do not contain those uh, specific inputs from forced labor. And how individual companies structure that compliance program, I've seen the full gamut. Uh, but I would just foot stomp, again, there is no de minimis threshold here for inputs made with forced labor. They all represent risk. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you again. All right, I'm ready to introduce the next speaker. We have Mr. Grant Cochran. He's the CEO of Ortane, a company that's on a mission to be the global leading verifier of authenticity through science and data, uh, through science and data science. Grant has used his diverse background, extensive strategic knowledge, and governance experience to oversee the commercialization of Ortane's scientific traceability service and the growth of the business globally for the past 12 years. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. I don't know who wrote that, but it was, um, certainly wasn't me. Um, so th today I'd like to, to go through um, about Oritane. I'd like to start off to talk a little bit about our company, uh, who we are, where we've come from and what we're doing. Then I'd like to talk about how we add value to clients, um, a little bit about the product and the science, and then finally walk through a case study of how somebody uses our technology. Okay. Um, so, uh, what we've done is we have commercialised forensic science. So the science came out of the criminal forensic field where it was used to prove where drugs come from, where bodies come from, etc. Um, so all we've done is taken that well-established science and applied it into uh, pharmaceuticals, food products and fashion products. The company was formed in 2008 in New Zealand by Professor Frew. Um, Professor Fru is a uh, leading scientist in the use of stable isotopes and other techniques. Uh, previously worked at the United Nations IAEA, overseeing their uh, traceability program. So formed in 2008, we've been perfectly timed the last two years before being perfectly mistimed the previous 13. So to a certain degree, we're, we're ahead of our time. Um, but over that time, we've amassed significant intellectual property around databases, around the algorithms required to manipulate the databases to be able to use the forensic science to prove where products come from. Um, as a company, uh, really proud of a couple of statistics. So one is our combined annual growth over the last six years is 95%, so we've been basically doubling every year. Really proud of that because we only do that from the willingness of clients to engage with us. Uh, we've got about 160 staff, we're looking for another 38, so if anyone's looking for a job, we're at the back of the room later. Um, but we're rapidly growing to be able to service the demand from our clients. A uh, very diverse young company, we'll have around about 25 different nationalities of those 160 staff. So why do we exist? What problems do we solve? So obviously forced labour is a central issue today. Um, by knowing where your product comes from, you can address these issues of forced labour, sustainability in ESG, um, whether it be deforestation, whether it be child labour in cocoa supply chains, whether it's forced labour um, in fishing, etc. And also authenticity. So we help protect intellectual property, we help stop counterfeit, um, we help um, identify if there's been adulteration. So an example would be 
infant formula in China which was adulterated with melamine. Um, so those type of things. So we broadly apply our science not just for forced labour, um, but for any issue where provenance is central. So, traceability is a word that we all are very familiar with. Um, we are slightly different on that. So, a normal traceability system will, be, will follow a product through a supply chain. Where we're different is we unlock the intrinsic properties of that product um, and match it back to an origin. So I could take the shirt that I'm wearing now and see if the cotton comes from California, whether it comes from China, India, Pakistan, wherever. So obviously that's got a massive relevance when we talk about issues of forced labor around the countries, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Xinjiang. It's not just Xinjiang. The weakness of a traditional traceability system is it's only as good as the weakest link. So if there is a breakdown for any reason, um, then the whole, system, the whole system falls apart. So how does it work? Um, I need to caveat, I am not a scientist, but um, we will have scientists here today if you'd like to talk to some of our team. But inherently we are, in, we are a product of the environment that we're in. So for example, the scientists could take my hair take a little bit at the start of the year and see that a year ago I was in New Zealand. More recently I've been in Switzerland. So this is, this is actually how it has been applied in forensic cases. And why is that? It's because every environment is slightly different. So in the schematic here, we'll look at the soil. So the strontium in the soil will be different depending upon the area. The hydrogen isotopes will be different depending upon the altitude. The sulfur will be different depending upon the distance from the coast, etc. So it's not a black box solution. The beauty of what we do is it's hypothesis based. We understand why fingerprints are different. So that makes it incredibly powerful. Not only can we differentiate the fingerprints, but we can say why they're different. So, trust but verify. It's, it's very appropriate being in the Ronald Reagan building. He made that quote famous in 1987 when he spoke to Gorbachev. He said, trust but verify. That's very much central to what we do. Once we have a fingerprint um, established, we can verify that anywhere along the supply chain, which is really, really powerful. So again, this shirt here, we could buy it at a retailer, we could take the sample in the manufacturer, we could take the sample from the cotton. So once we know what the issue is for the client, we can put accountability into the supply chain at any point. So Kit was mentioning, uh, I think to the last question, who is responsible? So the importer of record has the issue that their product will be stopped if it has a problem in the supply chain. This system allows people to put, put that accountability back into the supply chain. So a little bit more about, the, about what we do. Um, so it's a product test. It's a physical test. So we actually test the product itself. Um, the beauty of that is, it's once, once the databases are created, it's very, very easy to operate and it's very, very um, compatible with, with people's manufacturing systems. We're not in there all the time spraying something on or we're not in there auditing every single, every single transaction. We can just spot check um, the product itself. The strength of what we do is driven by the database. So the database is made up of a lot of different things. So yes, we have the physical samples. We know what, the, what their chemical makeup is. We can create the algorithms for, for the fingerprint of the product. But the database is a lot deeper than that. So what we can tell you is that the relative risk of a manufacturing site in Bangladesh versus Vietnam is X. Or we can tell you that a T-shirt versus a shirt, the, the risk is Y. So there's a lot of exhaust data in what we do, which creates a lot of really deep and rich insights into where the risk, where the risk lies. So these are powerful for regulators, for, for companies, for the brands, for the manufacturers. Um, most importantly, um, it's commercially proven. So. We learned very early on that scientists can, can do anything except make money. Um, so what we have done is we've, we've combined, sorry scientists in the room, but um, had to be said, but um, 
So we've combined forensic science, we've combined data science, but most importantly, we've combined commercial knowledge. So there's no point having a product if the industry won't if the industry won't take it up. So we put a lot of effort in working with other service providers, working with our clients to be able to get a really commercially valuable solution. So um, who do we work with? This technology has been adopted in over 25 different products in over 20 different countries. Um, many of our clients aren't in the aren't on public record, these ones are. We work with some fantastic industry bodies such as Cotton USA who are looking out to protect the industry, uh, the US cotton growing industry, the likes of Supima. So we can work with an industry body, we can work with a regulator, we can work with a brand. And it's not just about the negative, it's also about the positive. So there's a, a great example there with Primark who put a, a huge amount of effort into their sustainable sourcing, sustainable cotton program which is all based about empowering women in farming. So like, the science can be used to detect bad, but it can also be used to prove good. Um, so we've got a wide range of clients, um, but as I say, you know, many, many people prefer to fly under the radar. So what do the clients say about it? Um, I think the interesting one there is the results are useful either way, right? They either confirm what you thought and what you believed or they don't. Um, and both lead to next steps. So this is really important. A lot of people wonder, okay, these supply chains are really difficult. They're really murky, they're very deep, um, and they're very complicated. What do I do if I find a, find a problem? So we, we work really closely with clients to to provide the knowledge to give them the power to be able to make decisions. So it's all about being, in, it's better to operate from a position of knowledge than ignorance. Once you know you've got a problem, you can start to make changes. You can start to change supply chains. You can start to test the supply chains more. So it's all around empowering people by taking that scientific data and turning it into an insight of which they can take an action on. And look, no, none of our clients are perfect, we know that, they know that, everybody is working to improve, and like, it's all about progress to be able to eliminate these problems out of their supply chain. It's not easy, it's really, really difficult, but we can put a, a person on the moon so we can surely know where our cotton comes from. It can be done if you want to do it. It just takes time, it takes combining the likes of Karen, like Altana. There are a whole lot of different tools that need to be used. And like all tools, it comes down to using the most appropriate tool for the job to be done. So I just want to run through a case study. Um, so people say, like, how do, how do people actually use this in, in, in reality? So this is an example of a, um, of a big box retailer. Um, and what they've done is they've mandated, as part of their su supplier cotton sourcing program, standard operating procedure, that people must use a testing on the finished product. So they've mandated that to their suppliers. So to bring that to life, we work with a third party agent and that third party will independently sample, um, will collect samples through the supply chain according to a really strict chain of custody and standard operating procedures. So the beauty of that is if there's a problem, we can go back down the supply chain and find out what's happened and why. Um, then the cotton origin verification testing is done on any item containing cotton in this, in this example. Um, it, as Kit was saying, like it's not just cotton, we do tend to think about this specific issue around cotton, which is the largest one, but this could be any product. So this is across private label and also the brand, national branded items. The samples are submitted for testing um, against two things a claimed origin and or a prohibited origin. So for example, they might want to know whether this suit is made from genuine US Supima cotton. So that's testing against a claimed origin. Um, and if we test it for that and it's proven to be from the claimed origin, it's fine, it's clean. If not, they want to know, is it from a prohibited origin? So then we test against that. The most important thing at this point is, if it's consistent with the prohibited origin, 
the goods can't proceed. So a, a corrective action plan is then put in place, the products are stopped, correct, corrective, corrective action plan is put in place, um, and then the problem is remediated. We will then go back in the future and test to make sure that that has happened. Um, and we can also help the client by doing pre-production testing at tier two and beyond. So that, uh, that ensures that the issues are identified early on and that we can find the problem early and remediate. So that's an example of how, how the industry are using, using the solution in practice. Um, with that, uh, happy to open up, open up for any questions. Um, really identify that like, it, it is a very complicated issue. Um, it's a really tough challenge that, that, that people have got, to, got to, are faced with to fix. It's not easy. We're not the entire answer. We are a very, very, we refer to it as narrow and deep solution. We're very specialist in what we do. It's appropriate sometimes, not all the time, but by combining with other leading technology, um, we know that we can help solve the problem. So happy to answer any questions. Hi, Chandri Navarro from Hogan Levels. I have a question about your cotton testing procedure. When you're testing a bale of new cotton, how are you testing that bale? Are you finding specific points in the bale so that it's, we, we understand how accurate that is? And second, how about recycled cotton? And where is your science on that? Yeah, Thanks. Um, great. Um, I'll answer the difficult one first. So recycled is, is, is problematic. You know, it's not easy for us. Um, uh, we're looking at technology to do it. Um, we, we've made some really good progress on um, blended cotton, so cotton blended with polyester, nylon, etc. We've got that sorted. Um, the next challenge is recycled. So right now we don't have an off-the-shelf solution. Um, um, so in terms of where, where would we test in a bale? So, we will work really closely with the client to design a testing program. It's not even just at the bail, it's like where we test in the supply chain. Um, we've developed an algorithm to allow our clients to create a statistically defensible auditing program. So based on prevalence, criticality and detectability, we can tell clients how many samples they need to test at what point. So by way of example, um, it's, a, it's a sample population question. So if somebody was to audit your financial statements, they would take a subset of your statements and that would tell you the health. Likewise, if you want to know um, an election result, you'll, you'll poll 2,500 people to tell you what 2 million people will do. If you design it right, the sample is very accurate to the population. So our, our data and stats team developed that for our client. So what, what we want to do is make sure we don't have any bias in there. Um, so to your point about where we test, we make sure that we're doing it in a random scientific way, but really happy to talk about that offline. Hello, I'm Tim Roddy. I work for Vera Bradley on the IT side. Um, are you working with CBP to create a certified database of all this information so the, the border agents can actually use it to clear our shipments? Because that's our problem, is how do we get this data into the system and then it makes the agent's job much easier to clear and avoid a WR up. Yeah, great, great question. Um, um, so I think like what, what we can say is it's on the public record that we have a commercial relationship with CBP. Hugely proud of that. Um, in terms of databases, um, we are developing a, a, a portal for all clients to be able to access it. So we'd love to talk to you offline about what that looks like, but that is our vision. Um, we, we want the technology to be used as widely as possible, so on it. Hi, Grant. My name's Mary from Miller & Chevalier. Um, thanks for the great presentation. I had a question about, um, you were mentioning earlier, sort of spot checking different items in order to be able to use your technology in order to trace. And I'm wondering how that works within the context um, of CBP's new FAQs, where they talk about DNA and isotopic testing, um, and how you need to be able to make sure that what is being tested actually can be connected to the item that was specifically detained. So do you help importers in that process um, to make sure that those two connect? And sort of what does that look like? Thanks. Yeah, yeah. 
great question. So um, one, one solution that we're working on there is that a certificate um, of origin can be attached to the product that has got um, security features and so it can be proven that the certificate on the bale or the, or the shipment um, relates to that shipment. You know, it'd be easy for someone to create a counterfeit Oritain certificate um, and then we're worth nothing. So yes, we do have a technology. It's not, <coughs> excuse me, it's not rolled out commercially yet, but we've developed the prototype, so yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Wheeler. I'm the director of the Global Trace Protocol Project. My question is, you, uh, you said that you're able to check whether the cotton comes from a prohibited location or source, and so the question would be, can you identify the cotton that's coming from Xinjiang, China? Um, Yeah, that's, that's the service that we provide. Um, yeah. Hi, Caroline Dale from Flixport. Um, could you speak to any other commodity types that the testing is currently commercialized and, and prepared for, other than cotton? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Um, so, sure. So, um, cotton, wool, leather. Uh, red meat, coffee, um, we're working on timber, we're working on palm, um, we're working on some extractives such as mica, polysilicon, so um, yeah, it, it's broadly applicable. Um, the underlying science is largely the same, there are nuances. Um, yep, so there are a few. It, it also comes down to a resolution, so we can deliver a solution to like a farm of origin, a region of origin, or a country of origin. So we've got different resolutions. We also have different ways of asking the question. So we could say, um, does it come from California? Does it not come from India? Or where does it come from? There are three different questions and there are three different algorithms. So, um, and all of the time the databases are different. So yeah, there's a bit of nuance to it, but we're building them. Yeah. Hi, Christian Roseland, Clean Energy Associates. You mentioned polysilicon there. How do you look for the impurities in a very, very highly refined product such as polysilicon? Yeah, look, that's going through the R&D pipeline at the moment. It is really complicated. Um, we've had some really good progress recently. Um, in the room, my colleague um, Rupert Hodges, who's the deputy CEO, um, has been largely involved with that. Ru, put your hand up. That's him. Um, he, he can answer some detail about that. That's one of his projects. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, everybody. All right. Moving on to our next speaker. I'd like to introduce Ms. Amy Morgan. She, she is the head of trade compliance at Altana Technologies. And prior to Altana, Amy was vice president for cross-border at Avalara, responsible for developing technology solutions to automate landed cost calculation and cross-border tax compliance. Previously, Amy managed global trade and customs compliance operations for Amazon, Costco Wholesale, Nordstrom, and Microsoft. Amy is a licensed U.S. customs broker based in Seattle, where she was recognized as one of the Puget Sound Business Journal's Innovators of the Year in 2019 for using her big trade background to pursue progressive solutions to compliance challenges for companies of all sizes. Good morning, um, I'm Amy Morgan. I head trade compliance strategies for Altana. Did I do that? Um, Altana is using artificial intelligence to build a dynamic, shared, intelligent map of the global supply chain so that governments and companies can connect their data to see their multi-tier extended supply chains and to illuminate, so to illuminate their multi-tier supply chains and to facilitate trusted trade activity, including the elimination of forced labor. 
Before joining Altana, you heard my bio. I do have a, I, I was a trade compliance person. I managed trade compliance for some large US importers, just like many of you in this room today. And the UFLPA did not exist back then when I was managing trade compliance, but I still remember how painful it was to obtain that outer tier supplier uh, data in order to respond to CF28s or to do origin verifications or to file OGA declarations. I remember sending countless supplier emails. I remember uh, sending reminders and questionnaires and surveys. Uh, I remember getting responses and then sometimes not getting responses. Um, but all to trace the inputs of the finished goods that I was actually importing. So this is how I know that compliance with the UFLPA is going to require artificial intelligence support. Our traditional processes as trade compliance people just simply can't scale. And besides, compliance with the UFLPA is going to require more than simply mapping your extended supply chain. It requires more than simply mapping risk data. Static, manual, Questionnaires and surveys and audits alone are not going to get us there. So, Altana is using AI to build the only dynamic map of the global supply chain, a source of truth that we call the Altana Atlas. The Altana Atlas is made up, so we pull together, uh, sorry, my notes are sliding right off the podium. The Altana Atlas pulls together data sources from public sources, commercially available sources, uh, and non-public sources, first party data. We fuse that together, we clean it, we standardize it, so that uh, that makes up the map that I, I mentioned earlier, uh, but it also learns. So at Altana, we use federated machine learning models to pull all that data together so that the, the map itself learns from all of that data, public, commercially available, and non-public, so that we have shared intelligence without actually sharing sensitive user data. That's really important. The result is this dynamic map that reveals multi-tier networks automatically and enables and encourages collaboration across all supply chain stakeholders. The Altana Atlas is alive. It's dynamic, meaning it evolves as the world around us evolves. Our map is always on. It's constantly updating uh, as we add new trans transaction records weekly. We add new company information as companies move, close up shop, change names, change addresses. Or as new entities are added to the entity list or removed from the entity list, and as new WROs are issued or revoked, the Altana Atlas likewise responds. Now, as a trade compliance person, and some of you are supply chain managers as well, we are now required to know about the non-compliance that might be lurking way upstream in our value chains or downstream in our supply chains. Now, this, I, I, I don't know about all of you, but this is visibility that I don't believe we are equipped to handle. We never had to handle it at scale, right? This is exactly the sort of visibility that Altana offers. The Altana Atlas has done the hard artificial intelligence work, so all you have to do is use the data you already have to get the insights that you need to be compliant. When we onboard our customers to the Altana Atlas, we ask that they provide their supplier data, all right? Once we have that supplier data and we link it up to the Atlas, this is, situates a company or government's uh, own supply chain in the global network, the, the grand scheme uh, of things. Now we can see beyond that tier one, we can see beyond what you already know without having to issue questionnaires or surveys or any crazy emails or not getting any responses. You get to start from a place of trust. And it's only, in my opinion, and I believe, 
that it's only with this sort of network connectivity that we can derive the risk insights that we actually need to be compliant with the UFLPA. This same information is likely to be needed for other uh, net new policies and initiatives we've, seen, we've heard about that are lingering on the horizon, calculating greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, what about forced labor regulations beyond the United States? Deforestation, conflict minerals, increased sanctions. Same information is needed for all of those. I can even imagine a world where this same sort of network connectivity is required to help with the increased enforcement of current trade compliance priorities. Think about uh, validating the countries of origin, identifying possible transshipment or being able to predict what is and isn't a, a, a counterfeit product. So just imagine, what if you could see your entire supply chain network without painful effort? What if you could use artificial intelligence rather than manual screening to surface exposure? Imagine shrinking the haystack so that you could focus your expert resources on, and, and, and audit resources and investigation resources on only the most at-risk supplier activities. And finally, imagine that you were able to engage with your stakeholders at a meaningful level with real data rather than relying on them to come to you with that information. So if this next slide works, I'll be able to show you an actual video. I did record a short demo, uh, quite high level, but let's give it a whirl. This is the Altana Atlas in action specific to forced labor. In this example, I am a supply chain manager at Uniqlo, an international apparel company that sources textile items from factories in several countries and imports them all over the world. Today I want to know whether or not the manufacturer of any Uniqlo products has potential ties to forced labor activity. This effort would normally involve a long and expensive project, but with the Altana Atlas I can initiate this investigation with a quick search of my company name. When I search the Altana Atlas for Uniqlo, I'm presented with a list of search results, much like a Google search. And I can see the top result for Uniqlo Company Limited is likely the most relevant. Clicking into this result takes me directly to a knowledge graph view where I can explore Uniqlo's supply chain relationships. In this view, Uniqlo is the top node on the graph while the nodes below represent companies that have either sent to or received shipments from Uniqlo. Those shipments are represented by these links or edges that connect the nodes. Uniqlo is a large company with a lot of global trade relationships, which can be overwhelming. To make the review more manageable, I'll add a filter to reflect only those relationships with the most recent activity. This reduces the number of entities in my network, making it easier to continue my analysis. With this narrowed view, I can explore any of these supply chain relationships to learn more about who these companies are, who they trade with, and if any of their relationships could pose a potential threat to my business. For example, perhaps I'm interested in the supplier Juoco Denoa. When I click on this company, a summary of their business appears on the right sidebar. And when I click on the edge that links them to Uniqlo, I see the number of shipments transacted with access to a table of detailed information about those transactions. I can also explore which other companies this supplier is engaged with and look for any potential risk flags in their network that could be harmful to my business. However, to determine the sustainability profile of a company, it's not enough to simply understand their business relationships. So not only has Altana constructed Uniqlo's extended supply chain relationships, but it has likewise constructed the more granular, multi-tier value chains that make up those relationships. With one click into the value chain screen, I'm presented with Uniqlo's multi-tier value chains. In this view, Uniqlo's company facilities are represented as the Tier 0. The Tier 1 represents Uniqlo's direct suppliers. These are largely the manufacturers we source finished goods from. From the Tier 1, 
we can derive their suppliers at the tier 2 and their suppliers at the tier 3 and so on. For the first time, I have visibility beyond my direct tier 1 relationships. And this view traces the flow and transformation of inputs from raw materials to the finished product, linking manufacturers to their suppliers and their suppliers, so I can see beyond the entities producing Uniqlo garments to those suppliers who are making the fabrics and spinning the yarns, all the way to growing the cotton or extruding the synthetic materials. And it didn't require that I manage any manual questionnaires or surveys. The Altana Atlas did all the hard work for me. Most sustainability goals like climate, carbon, natural resource consumption, regulatory compliance or human rights will require starting from this granular view in order to see how their supply chains align with relevant commitments. But because I'm focused on forced labor today, I'm going to filter these value chains for the specific risk type that we are looking for. This filter works because not only did the Altana Atlas construct Uniqlo's multi-tier value chains, it simultaneously screened the entities in those chains for potential forced labor exposure. Right away, I can see that there are several Uniqlo chains that may be compromised at, as indicated by the warning flags visible here at the tier two and three level. To make this view even more manageable, I can filter for a specific supplier. Let's say Shenzhen. So I can focus on understanding how this company out at the tier three level may be relevant to my business. Altan has made it easy to connect these risk dots. By clicking on the warning indicators, we have access to an explainer that tells us Shenzhen Wafu was flagged because they are linked to companies located in Xinjiang, China, which is a region subject to forced labor restrictions. This explainer also provides links to the supporting source citation, which can save hours of manual research later. I hadn't seen that one in a while. It's weird to hear your own voice played really, really loud. Back to you. Um, <laughs> I hope that demo inspired some ideas around how you could also use the Altana Atlas to comply with the UFLPA. Uh, but over the break, somebody asked me if I would provide a few of my own favorite use cases just to inspire additional thoughts. So I said sure, so I jotted a few down. So first of all, piggybacking off of what the previous two speakers said, this sort of insight would allow you to take early action to provide possible, uh, to identify possible exposure sooner. So the sooner you can start investigating, right, and gather all that evidence, uh, the better, because once there's a detention, it's often too late. Uh, you could also save these insights as part of your record keeping program. This way you could prove how exposure may have been identified but was later addressed. Uh, on their own, these sorts of insights are not going to satisfy an admissibility package, but they could help you construct one. So if you had access to this sort of a value chain, now you automatically know. It's like a blueprint. I know who, who I need to go collect which documents from making it a little less, uh, what I, I say, a little less shot in the dark and more paint by number. Now you might also consider proactively communicating any identified exposure with CBP, uh, or maybe in support of your CTPAT obligations, maybe as evidence that you're actually uh, going above and beyond to exercise reasonable care with the forced labor minimum security criteria. You could also maximize your compliance investments by sharing these insights with third parties like an Oritane to optimize the investments you're making. So perhaps you're not auditing everything, you're auditing only those things that have a likelihood of being exposed. And finally, it's also possible to layer in additional data. You heard from Kit and Grant earlier, they all, Caron offers data sets, Moody's offers data sets. Uh, that can all be layered in. Because Alton has created this map, adding additional data elements, I say it's easy, 
but Peter over here, my colleague, is, is probably going to tell me it's not that easy. But it's so easy. It's just data, right? You just plug it in, and it works. So if the regulations continue to assert that exercising reasonable care means taking an active role in knowing who your extended supply chain partners are, incorporating AI is the only way we're going to do that at scale. But fortunately, we have the right technology at the right time in the world. Uh, and with that, I'm happy to take questions. If they are technical, I will make Peter answer them. I'm a trade nerd, not an engineer. So. Hi, Amy. It's Virginia Hi. from Miller & Chevalier. Good to see you. Likewise. <laughs> Your interface looks awesome. It's so impressive. Um, I have a couple questions, so I'll probably need to talk with you afterwards as well, which is a benefit for me. Um, I, have, I guess one question I have immediately is just which, um, which data you're using to actually conduct the screenings. You mentioned the kind of ability to screen suppliers mm -hmm. there. I'm wondering, is that like an Exeger or a Caron? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great question. So to do the screening part, uh, we do incorporate all of the international uh, restricted party lists that money can buy, uh, we have incorporated. We've also incorporated the entity list, all the WROs, uh, the Sheffield report, uh, and then, so that's what makes up the screening currently. Uh, as far as the Caron or Exeger or any of these other data elements, those could be layered on as additional. Uh, we welcome that, actually. Uh, we all work very well together. That is the intent. Um, I think I answered the question. It was all yeah, just about absolutely. the screening, right? Right. So if a company's already using Exeger to conduct their screenings, they could exactly. potentially work with you guys to layer that on as well. Is that, yeah. is it that yeah. easy? Yeah. Peter says, yeah, it's that easy. It's just data, right? It's absolutely. Awesome. Um, I guess the second question I had, uh, and then I'll seed. Um, you mentioned like other companies' inputs plugging in. So obviously, a company comes in, they have the blueprint, and then they can kind of maybe do some of their own diligence to confirm the supply chain is accurate for mm -hmm. one of their products. Right? right. So would their data then be in your system and available for other companies to view? So no. Is the short answer. So what, what you saw was a very high level demo. I only had a very short period of time, right? We could show you a more in-depth demo where at risk or likely exposed uh, value chains or supply chains could be, uh, you have the control to verify them. You could say in review, verified, they've been cleaned or this is high risk and I want to make some better decisions about what, what I do. Um, we could show you that. So the controls are now whether or not other people can see it, no. The way we deploy, and again, Peter, step in, please, because no, no, no. <laughs> uh, is every client, when we work with them, all of their data lives in its own, we call it a spoke. So it's a virtual private environment where their data goes, their data doesn't leave, and their data, nothing goes in, nothing comes out. Actually, one of our big uniquenesses is that we deploy our data to the technology. We don't ask you to put your technology into our data. So we call this, when I say federated learning, it's we take the intelligence from your data, not the data itself, but the intelligence from that data comes back to feed the graph. So the graph is constantly growing and evolving and improving, which makes your results a lot more accurate. But we're not sharing anybody's sensitive data. Did I get that OK? No, no, that was exactly right. I mean, we built out this private enclave system to enable sort of this risk management while respecting data privacy, sovereignty, and security. Um, so have your cake and eat it, too. Yep. Awesome. Thank you. Very cool. Hi. Caroline from Flexport. Virginia hit my first two questions, so that's perfect. <laughs> um, so from the knowledge graph view, um, I'm assuming that that's reliant on both sort of customer data and public shipping data to get to those uh, shipping partners. How do you deal with issues of manifest confidentiality or modes of transportation there? Oh, this question has come up five times already this week, and it's only Tuesday. Uh, so we, so that data that we purchase, that, that commercially available data uh, that we acquire, that anybody could buy, right? Um, I don't know, actually, maybe, Peter, this is a question from yesterday. Yeah. I can just ask you. I don't know if when you have vessel manifest confidentiality, if that data is redacted or just left out of that data that we purchase. I don't even know if you know the I, answer I, to that. I can actually speak okay, to this. Okay, that's yeah. great. That's my pleasure. 
So yeah, thank you for the question. So first of all, I'll start off by saying we're very proud of our knowledge graph. It's the largest that we know of. It's not perfect. There are things we can see, and there are things we can't see. Um, what we set up is, so manifest confidentiality, for example, um, we have two approaches to dealing with that. One, triangulating through multiple data sources, so it may be redacted or otherwise censored in one, but available in another. Two, the federated knowledge of the knowledge, the federated nature of the knowledge graph, by which I mean um, through its multiple deployments, it can access proprietary and first party data that gives more signal. And then three, we have um, probabilistic methods, which are not displayed here. I mean, we've shown you everything that's deterministic, but other approaches to sort of rate risk and deal with redaction that we continue to develop. Um, so I'm happy to speak to that latter point in more detail at a later time, but um, really the desire and what we've gone through here is to build something that brings you the best information available from both first party, and, uh, proprietary, and commercial data that is dynamic updating to multi-tier and then allows a flow to go through and investigate any vagueness or uncertainty in a rigorous way. And so we gestured a little bit towards that interface there. So thank, thank you for the question. I, I hope I answered uh, it. Thank you. Hi, Amy. Jasmine Martell from Hush Blackwell. Um, I have a quick question on uh, the network connectivity that you're building. Um, one of my questions is, on, in regards to an industry perspective, uh, what does that look like as far as your users? And are you seeing that um, a lot of your data is more so um, gained from like the apparel industry or users in a certain area? Um, or is it even as far as the information that companies are receiving? So I can take the users if you want to take the coverage. Okay. So as far as users go, uh, we target three, three user types. So we do target government. I'd be remiss if I didn't say CBP or any other customs authority is certainly a target market for us. We also target logistic service providers. So we have a very public, very... Uh, deep relationship with Maersk, for instance, where if you are a Maersk client and you are interested in what I showed you today, reach out to your Maersk folks because we have a, a relationship with them specific to forced labor, uh, but other logistics service providers who want to offer similar value-added services such as forced labor visibility is definitely right up in our space. And the third market would be enterprise. A lot of the companies in this room are potential clients of ours or could, are already clients of ours. So. That's, that's where we spread out across those three users. But as far as data coverage, Peter, I'll let you take it. Yeah, so thank you for the question. So speaking to data coverage, we're actually covering all physical goods and in general, all modes of transit. Now, of course, sort of, there are different areas where we have even more data and areas where we have less, and this is a function both of our data sources, our deployments, all of these things. But I will note that um, in principle, it's covering, you know, some of these data sets are the scale of entire economies. Um, in fact, many of them are, and as such, it's widely applicable. Thank you. Cool. Well, you can't miss me, so if you have other questions, please find me, uh, and we do have a table in the back, but thank you for inviting us. All right, everybody, three quick reminders before we break for lunch. First, um, the CVP team is eager to engage with you, so if you have any questions, please find someone with a green lanyard and ask away. Second, please stop by the Rotunda during the lunch break to meet our team members there. We've got the CTPAD team, we've got our human resources team, and we have several companies that are eager to, to talk to you there. And finally, we encourage you to use the continental rooms, which are shown on this map here, the red dots, um, to you know, meet with people and have discussions there. Um, with that, we're going to take a lunch break and be back here to start at 1 p.m. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, I think we're going to get started now. Uh, just a reminder that each of the companies presenting will speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have 10 minutes of Q&A. We've got the microphones right there, so you can queue on up when it's time to ask questions. Um, but we also have somebody who is roving with the microphone, so you can always call them over and 
um, you know, speak that way if, if, uh, if you need to. Um, so let's get started with the first introduction. Um, we've got Dr. Brett Tipple. So Dr. Tipple is a chief scientist of Flora Trace. Brett is a substantive expert on geographic origin tracing and authentication methods. During his career, he has supported law enforcement in solving cold cases, helped identify and repatriate U.S. service members' remains, and combated food and beverage fraud in the private sector. Dr. Tibble? Thank you, and thanks for, uh, for having us. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, and we appreciate the, uh, the, the, in, the invite. Um, yeah, I'm Brett Tipple. I'm the chief scientist and president of Flora Trace. And Flora Trace, we seek to help companies, big and small, manage the risk of hidden forced labor in their supply chains. At our core, we're a scientific company that applies leading edge technologies to determine the origin of organic and geologic materials. We utilize forensic chemistry and data science approaches to assess where a material was grown or produced. These technologies support importers by helping them demonstrate their materials did not originate in Shenzhen wholly or in part, and they play very well with a lot of the other solutions that we've heard uh, about uh, this morning. So, if you're detained under the UFLPA, an importer may claim that the UFA, UFLPA doesn't apply to them as their goods did not originate in Shenzhen. For the applicability review, the importer will be challenged to provide evidence of geographic origin. The question is, how do you scientifically and quantitatively demonstrate that your goods did not originate from Shenzhen? So consider these two piles of tomatoes here. Can you tell which pile came from Shenzhen and which one came from, say, India? I know what you guys are all thinking. Those two piles are exactly the same. I can't see a difference. And that is enforcement's perspective as well. One tomato looks just like the other tomato. So is there a way to distinguish uh, this pile of tomatoes from Shenzhen from this pile of tomatoes from India? When they look, feel, taste, smell exactly the same. What about the individual tomatoes within that pile? Was there any commingling uh, between the different growing regions in that pile of, of tomatoes? What about the uh, tomato paste, that finished project, product, where there's hundreds of individual tomatoes that go into that? How do you know that that starting material was Shenzhen free? By looking at these tomatoes, these questions seem impossible to answer. But in fact, you can answer all these questions because orga organisms naturally record the geographic origin, their geographic origin within their tissues. The innate chemical characteristics of all living things actually reflect how and where it was grown. Um, here's an example of, uh, staying on the tomato theme, uh, a little baby tomato plant. This tomato plant will build its tissues, the carbon, the hydrogen, the oxygen that it's going to incorporate in those tissues from the water that's being supplied to it, from the atmosphere that it's taking in. It will incorporate elements uh, and other isotopes from the soil and the fertilizer that it's being fed. Since these chemical characteristics depend on where and how the plant was grown, these variations provide a unique chemical profile, or what we call an origin fingerprint of geographic origin. So consider that most of us here in the room can grow tomatoes in our home garden, wherever we live. The innate chemistry of each of those tomato plants are each our own individual little tomato flax plants reflect where, where, we, where we grew them and how we grew them. How, did we take care of them? Did we leave them uh, for that week when we went to vacation? That's gonna be reflected in the chemical characteristics of those plants. And so each of your little tomato plants will have a unique uh, origin fingerprint associated with it. Our company, Floor Trace, Floor Trace measures these origin fingerprints. And this allows us to determine the geographic origin of materials. 
And this is how we help importers demonstrate the origins of their products. So how does this work in a commercial, uh, commercial good and products? So we work with companies and their suppliers to first identify the unique characteristics, chemical characteristics, and define an origin fingerprint for their product. Since the origin fingerprint is naturally embedded within the material itself, it can be used throughout the uh, supply chain. It can be sampled at any point to confirm the origin of that product. With a well-designed origin testing program, it can be demonstrated that a product was not mined or produced in Shenzhen using this technology. The importer can include this sort of information to support their claims of a UFLPA applicability review. So in practice, <clears throat> we help importers better understand their supply chains and enhance their sustainability, sustainable sourcing practices. The steps in this process first include an understanding of the type of product and how it's grown and where it's grown and the type of environment it's grown in. Next, we'll go about collecting authentic materials. We'll analyze them to determine a, a baseline, a chemical baseline. The type of data we'll collect is isotopic values, elemental abundances, the relationships between these uh, pieces of data, as well as a lot of other metadata associated with the, the growing region and other uh, uh, parameters. During this period of time, we'll also identify and collect other authentic materials from outside this very specific region. We're gonna use those uh, to compare um, our, our authentics from the region we wanna uh, define. Then we're gonna dig down into that data and we're gonna find that unique profile, that unique chemical profile. And from there, we're gonna identify and isolate a, a origin fingerprint for that targeted uh, growing location. We use these origin fingerprints to verify the origin of the latter products. And we compare these data with the other data that we've generated from outside that specific region. So that way we can say it is versus not from the very specific region that we, 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 we're claiming it's from. We use a wide variety of statistical methods to quantitatively demonstrate that the targeted good originated from the specific growing area and not Shenzhen. Here's an example of the type of clients we might work with. Here's a, say, a medium-sized consumer good company importing onion products from India into the United States. They have a really great relationship with their suppliers. They regularly visit the facilities um, and visit the uh, production sites as well. Their suppliers indicate that they only purchase uh, Indian onions while the importer trusts their supplier, they know that about 25% of the global onion supply is grown in China with the majority of that grown in Shenzhen. This is a proactive importer. They understand that onions like this are gonna be at risk of forced labor and likely to be targeted. And they understand that a lot of the Shenzhen onions are being shipped into India to be processed. We worked with them to demonstrate that the imported onion products were not produced in Shenzhen. They not only used the outputs of the origin testing program as evidence in the event of an, a detainment and applicability review, but they can also demonstrate to their clients that their products do not originate from Shenzhen and are free of forced labor. So our science has been pioneered in collaboration with law enforcement and the intelligence community. My background's in forensic science. Uh, this came out of a lot of uh, uh, high-level uh, research and development projects with the federal government. Our background is in uh, using this technology in a lot of legal uh, contexts. Uh, we're very rigorous, and our data is reproducible. Um, some of the things that we've worked on, um, you know, uh, Sourcing anthrax spores back in 2001 here in uh, D.C., uh, counterfeit currency as well as um, understand the origins of narcotics and other um, uh, illicit uh, drugs, identifying and linking um, where explosives are made. It's important to note that our, our solution 
verifies the geographic origin with natural chemistry. We're not spraying anything on it. It's labeled naturally by the environment. We're testing the actual product itself and it cannot be rec replicated. These origin fingerprints cannot be replicated. Compare that to some other uh, solutions out there, uh, genetic DNA solutions. They're gonna identify the strain or the species, but you can grow a particular species at many different uh, locations. And then against a uh, paper or label, you know, those are only gonna track the packages, not the actual materials inside. Our technology actually tracks the materials itself. So some of the things about what we offer, um, I talked a, a bit about our origin assignment and verification program. We also do growth condition uh, verification that is uh, uh, organic versus conventional fertilizers, uh, as well as sort of if a product has been grown indoors or outdoors. Um, areas that we work in around, around these concepts are around uh, ESG, as well as um, um, protecting um, um, specific uh, uh, intellectual property uh, for you know a product that might have a unique uh, characteristic based on where it's where it's produced we also do analytical testing um, we're very good at research development if there's a, there's a problem um, uh, we can help design uh, a research around that to, to get an answer to that and we also have advisory services to help uh, uh, clients uh, understand their risk and, and answer some of their questions about um, our tools. So our expertise in our pipeline here, um, focusing on the UFLPA, we work a lot with uh, foods, beverages, agricultural products, as well as uh, geologic materials as well. So why Flora Trace? You know, we're here in, the, we're a domestic laboratory. Um, our laboratories are in Utah. Um, given our background in the uh, legal and government uh, work, we have very good chain of custody and secure storage uh, protocols, as well as that our data uh, stands up as evidence in the court of law, it meets the Daubert standard. It's been challenged multiple times and has met these challenges. Um, we strive uh, to do fast turnaround and be as cost effective as absolutely possible. Um, so I can stop there and I'd love to take your questions and um, we will be back at the um, uh, table in the back. So please come up to the the, uh, the microphones. Hi, Cindy DeLeon with DeLeon Trade. Thank you for your presentation. Can you go into a little bit more detail into the chain of custody piece, especially in the context of a CBP detention notice? Yeah, so we, 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 we have protocols in place for chain of custody. You know, we have all the the uh, the, 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 the signature uh, forms and things like that. So we would provide those sorts of documentations, envelopes, and things like that that would have be sealed. Provide those uh, in the event of, of a detention. Um, that's something that you know we're we're would be working on for that actual application. So that would be something. Perfect. Thank you. All right, so we're ready for our next speaker, uh, Mr. Michael Prorock. Um, he is the founder and CTO of Measure.io. He is a highly accomplished technology executive with deep expertise in machine learning, analytics, and decentralized systems. I'm told he also has a passion for outdoors photography and woodworking and resides in a small town on the border of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, which I'm personally very interested to hear more about later. Um, you're up. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, as mentioned, I'm uh, from out in that Montana direction, and uh, I got to leave beautiful 50-degree sunny weather to come out here and possibly get some snow, so we'll see how that all goes. I um, wanted to start by just talking a little bit about some 
quick company background and how we got from kind of starting the company back in 2016, uh, living out in small farm country in North Carolina uh, to today. And really, I started this company with a mind of working specifically at the farm level and to look at data across the board from, I can't tell. Oh. There you go, it's actually behaving now. Um, you know, started working primarily at the farm level to make predictions and recommendations out to farmers. That led us to building up a whole bunch of not just environmental data, um, but to then perform automated machine learning on top of that environmental data to understand what was actually going in on, on at the field level. How much growth could be occurring, uh, what diseases were present, how much uh, could be present in the pipeline at any given time. We expanded from there when COVID hit into applying our technology to start broader tracking disease uh, kind of spread, outbreak, impact, all sorts of fun stuff there. Not just on the crop side, but also on the human side. And then from there started broadening our systems out because they work on unstructured data broadly to go ahead and look at trade information. So today talking about forced labor, there's a couple of key problems there, right? With forced labor, you've got really specific problems, mostly in the fact that the data is all over the place. Um, even the data that we see that's been highly qualified and heavily reviewed has all sorts of problems in it, and it changes all the time. The other aspects are is because of that, we wind up with huge margins for error in terms of data collection and assessment. When we look at things like physical testing and tracing, it's important, it's a key part of it, but it's expensive. And even there, when we look at items like cotton where you have inherent processes like lay down during the milling process, where cotton from different regions is blended to actually get a product you can work with, makes it really hard to trace down each individual fiber. Additionally, basically no products that we deal with at the consumer level are you know, a single product. Even something like this shirt probably has five or six different manufacturing steps going in, not just cotton from different areas, but the collar might be made at one particular factory and then assembled at a cut and sew facility in India or elsewhere. So why did we go ahead and build the EarthStream platform? We went ahead and put it together largely, as mentioned, first to start dealing with climate risks and what the impact was gonna be at the farm. The other side was to actually go through and start a process of building out an actual digital twin for every component that we're looking at worldwide. So every single farm, every single actor in the supply chain, um, every single entity as they change names or relocate, and firmly to base all of this stuff on hard science, really starting back at the biological and environmental modeling side, based on field data and collecting that information, continually analyzing it, but then also recognizing the fact that we didn't want to get into a chat GPT situation and have to keep placing band-aids on the outputs of our models. We wanted to build the ability for scientists to actually put logistic inputs into our system at the front end side and review data before it actually goes out for recommendation purposes. So how do we go ahead and attack the forced labor problem? We attack that a couple of different ways, but we really do start at the source. We're continually going through and monitoring information, what crops can be grown where, what can be mined where, and actually going through and looking at, very similar to what we've heard from some other folks, right, because there's only kind of one common sense way to do this, to go through and actually follow that stuff outbound from the source. When we then intersect that stuff with customer information or other information we encounter on the web, we trace backwards towards that source and let those two graphs intersect. And we do all of this with a process of continuous learning and continuous information gathering. We don't actually send human analysts out to go out and you know, collect a bunch of information. We don't have rooms full of people. We've built a bunch of models to do this stuff for us. So how do we do this from a data standpoint? we start literally at the imaging and remote uh, sensing standpoint, right? We're looking at everything from synthetic aperture radar to actual growth conditions in the field and mapping that on an ongoing basis and continually improving models for processing that data and intersecting it with the unstructured data that we find on the web that say might be an assessment report from Sheffield or otherwise. We go through and actually break apart and understand when we identify cases of forced labor what economically is driving that and creating the situations uh, on the ground that are actually leading to the benefits of forced labor there, right? Obviously, there are genocide aspects, as we do see in the case of China, 
but there are broader things there, right? The reason it comes into play from a forced labor standpoint, frankly, is because it's economically advantageous to the PRC. We also then are continually tracing every piece of information we can find on the web and continually expanding our crawlers for information that take unstructured data, break it apart, and automatically link it together and qualify it with other information we've already encountered. What does this look like? Simple dashboard standpoint, right? We customize this, look and feel wise, logo wise, et cetera, for our customers, and we turn on modules as may be appropriate. We're looking at a trade dashboard here, looking specifically at some cotton output and some anonymized media that's coming in. Um, but we obviously have different dashboards in play when we're looking at things like disease outbreaks or other uh, you know, risks of, say, port closures and things like that. We also, though, have this notion that we're never going to know everything and that we have to have a way for users of our system to go ahead and direct the system as to how it should utilize the machine learning and algorithms built into it. So users can upload their own documents in any format. We take those documents as they are, identify every company in them, every entity, every product, every organization, and then use that to further information gathering. We cross-reference everything geospatially. We're not just looking at interior mapping. We're going through and actually trying to physically map all of these items in addition to who is supplying who and then continually identifying additional information as it arrives in real time in order to present before an analyst so that they can make appropriate decisions. Down to the farms, the mines, the oil wells where the raw materials are extracted. Um, the good news is we've had some time to work on this and, and in the past 12 years uh, at SourceMap, uh, we've been able to help, uh, right now there are more than 250 brands that use SourceMap to map their supply chains. And we're able to get all of these industries here to map down to the raw material origins. So the good news is supply chain mapping is here. It's eminently doable. And in fact, hundreds of companies already do it. But it's not evenly distributed. And so I'm going to talk to you about that. Now, supply chain mapping is also why do people do it? It was a sustainability priority for many years. It only recently became a trade compliance focus. So it is, in fact, used source map to manage risk of many kinds, uh, resilience, sustainability, uh, but also compliance with programs like CTPAT, which, which is here today, with various European due diligence laws, and then finally with forced labor due diligence, which encompasses Section 307 and the UFLPA. In fact, uh, Time Magazine named SourceMap's uh, forced labor due diligence uh, solution uh, invention of the year 2022 when it was launched in June uh, last year. Uh, okay, what makes SourceMap unique? Uh, so. Section 307, uh, forced labor enforcement in general, is extremely broad. Right? It's global in application, and it covers all industries and all raw materials. SourceMap is the only universal supply chain mapping software. Uh, every company buys a combination of mined and, 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 and farmed and synthesized raw materials and turns them into proprietary products that follow unique bills of materials or recipes. Uh, so what you need to map a global supply chain and ensure there's no forced labor is a universal supply chain mapping tool that can be sent to all suppliers in all countries all at once to get all the way back to where the raw materials come from. Uh, we verify that data, the data that's submitted by the supply chain through continuous tracking of the transactions, and that means the receipts, the bills of lading. We continuously verify the supply chain data, and that means cross-referencing, that means looking for fraud, uh, that means looking for counterfeiting, adulteration every step of the way. Um, and we do all of that in highly secure databases that are managed by our customers because this is all very sensitive data. And this is not data coming from the public do domain. This is actually every company's own supply chain, its own formulations, its own transactions down to raw materials. And then last but not least, we've transformed a handful of industries into being transparent, uh, but there are a few that are left. And so we also have uh, a large team of experts that helps transition companies into this new normal of supply chain transparency. Uh, all, all in all, SourceMap provides basically the, the full suite of software that a company needs to match the CBP importer guidelines, okay? So that means everything from supply chain mapping, identifying all of the stakeholders in the supply chain through transaction traceability to verify the supply chain, 
risk assessment to independently verify the veracity of that data, uh, collecting supporting evidence, things like mitigation plans and corrective action plans, and then finally reporting. Uh, just a few interesting tidbits. On average, a customer of SourceMap discovers for the first time 20,000 suppliers that they did not know that they had through the process of supply chain mapping, which I'll, I'll go over. That's a lot of new companies that our customers discover that they're in business with, and they now have to communicate with them to take reasonable care and ensure that they're compliant. Uh, there are tens of thousands, if not more, individual product codes that have to be uploaded into SourceMap in order to trace all of the bills of materials for the typical customer. And more than 100 gigabytes of supporting documents are collected annually. So it's tough to do this with emails and spreadsheets and PowerPoint. You really need a dedicated database and data collection tool. Here's what it looks like when all the hard work is done. Uh, supply chain mapping is, um, uh, as everybody knows, it's putting GPS points on every single supplier in the supply chain. Why? Because the, once it's mapped, you can audit it. So this is the, the gold star, the gold standard for supply chain transparency. Uh, on the right, you see a network diagram. That's actually the flows of material uh, from between actors in the supply chain. Extremely important to know which uh, items are in an individual container, but also to understand which suppliers are still active. Uh, and then risk assessment, which is an overlay of third-party data to independently verify the risk of the supply chain. Supply chain mapping uh, it works through a cascading workflow uh, that is extremely effective. Um, it basically uh, works like LinkedIn, if you're familiar with social networks. Companies invite their tier one suppliers who invite their tier one suppliers who invite their tier one suppliers. And over a sequence of several weeks, that gets down to the tier five, six, seven suppliers of raw materials. Uh, so this process starts with SAP or another kind of enterprise uh, supplier database, and then it quickly uh, balloons into those tens of thousands of newly discovered suppliers. When it comes time to verify the supply chain, uh, that's all done through data that can be uploaded asynchronously, which is to say, you know, if you're farming, you're farming goods on their own schedule before a purchase order has been placed. If you're manufacturing, you're waiting for your customer to place a purchase order. All of these entities are uploading transaction records into SourceMap. Uh, if they don't have their own inventory management system, they can just use SourceMap as an inventory management system. And we stitch together the data once the purchase order has been placed and the shipping documents are ready for import. Um, verification. Once you've mapped your supply chain, that's when you can start to verify it. Uh, there are many kinds of verification that we conduct ourselves looking at the data, but also in partnership with others who provide very powerful uh, data sets to look for risk. Uh, we, we normalize the supplier IDs. We, we use global business identifiers. We deduplicate the suppliers geographically. We look for risks that are geographic in nature. Uh, we look for risks in the volumes that are being traded. Uh, that would mean places where there could have been adulteration, places where there could have been counterfeiting, uh, and also places where capacities don't match uh, what is being produced. So too many things being produced somewhere, not enough people, not enough machines, not enough land. We have a mismatch, and that's a red flag for unauthorized subcontracting. We also partner with database providers such as Caron, who you heard earlier today, uh, extremely high quality data about the risk that a supplier in a customer supply chain is affiliated with an entity on a named list or uh, with an entity that is otherwise uh, high risk. And we bring all of that information to our customers proactively so that they can put in place those corrective action plans and ensure that none of these risks are actually affecting their supply chain. Um, Something very important about supply chain mapping uh, when you are doing it with enterprise data is that we've created a standard for, for vast amounts of data to be shared within a supply chain. And so that means that data has to be very carefully shared. Okay, so there are no data can ever be shared between competitors. It can never be shared between suppliers in the supply chain. All of the data is for the benefit of the importer. Uh, so all of the vendor IDs, all of the transaction records, those are all put onto local servers that are managed by the importer. The data is anonymized and aggregated whenever possible. Anything we can do to shield uh, personal data in the case of privacy regulations and to shield 
uh, trade secrets in the case of, of proprietary formulations, for example. And we do all of that in the aim of being able to issue a verified by source map check mark, which is to say enough data has been collected about that supply chain that we can be sure that it is authentic. Um, okay, last but not least on how it works, supplier outreach. So there's a lot of promise in, in artificial intelligence. There's a, there was a, a lot of promise in blockchain. None of this works without some significant culture shift inside industry. And we've seen it happen for apparel, we've seen it happen for food, we've seen it happen for luxury, we're seeing it happen for pharmaceuticals and the automotive sector. And there are other industries that are just starting, uh, but none of it works without uh, very concerted supplier outreach. And so we have a playbook, we have a checklist, we know exactly what steps suppliers must go through to be introduced to the idea of supply chain transparency and to take part and to see the benefits for themselves. Uh, and, and what that does is it achieves pretty tremendous response rates for upstream suppliers. Um, reporting is, is uh, I already showed you, but uh, maybe the, the part that is um, the biggest time saver, uh, other than if you've ever tried to map a supply chain in PowerPoint, you know that it's nice when there's a piece of software that automatically visualizes the entire thing for you, is we also have PDFs that you can print. So if you prefer paper, as I know many people do, uh, you can actually just print that report for that container and hand it over to whoever's asking. Um, uh, we've had the, the good fortune of talking to nearly a thousand companies in the last three years, and we're able to provide each industry with the adoption workflows, with the transition plans that are suited to them. So if you're coming to SourceMap and you're an apparel company, more than 50% of your suppliers are already in SourceMap providing data to your competitors. It's a very, very quick launch. If you're in the energy and renewable space or semiconductors, it's a bit of a longer journey and it starts with preparing and planning a communication to your entire supply base as to why this is such an important activity to be part of. So depending on where you are, food and ag, uh, you'll see most of the largest uh, brands in the US already using SourceMap today. Uh, there's other reasons to map supply chains. So if you, you know, if you ever say, well, this is too much of a burden just for compliance, it isn't. Uh, it's too much of a burden, I would argue, to not find out until you run out of raw materials that your tier two or tier three supplier is a single choke point upon which your entire global business relies. And so more often than not, when companies map their supply chains for the first time, they will discover that in tier two or tier three, they are heavily concentrated in parts of the world that they don't want to be dependent on or with individual actors that don't have the capacity to meet their growth projections. And that's exactly the, the, the big value. So if you, want to be compliant with UFLPA, you need to map your supply chain. But if you want to sleep at night and know that your company can continue to grow, you also want to map your supply chain. In the case of the UFLPA, the, the forced labor due diligence solution, incredibly rapid adoption since it was launched in June of 2022, more than 5,000 suppliers already participating in the data sharing efforts towards the UFLPA compliance. I think even more than usual, every, every supplier in tier one that gets invited to source map for FLDD for the forced labor due diligence solution yields 20 new suppliers that were not in our customers databases before. So if you start with a thousand suppliers, you now have 20,000. So uh, incredibly uh, rapid adoption uh, and uh, in amazing impact. I'll give you one little example in the two minutes I have left. Um, what happens? Well, you know, you've heard about a lot of solutions that can mine public data for the probable affiliations of your suppliers with n bad actors. Uh, SourceMap is a system of record, so we actually hold the data on the actual transactions that happen in the supply chains. Our customers are often confronted with probabilities that their supply chains contain bad actors, and they come back after looking in the SourceMap database with, with a definitive proof for or against those assertions. So I'll give you an example. We had a customer that had a flagged supplier, and we were able to show that uh, while it's true that that tier three supplier had done business with a named entity in the past, the materials that were manufactured by that alleged uh, contact were not used in any of our customers' products. And that's something that you can only do when you understand 
the actual bill of materials, the formulation of the products, the actual records of transactions, and then the supply chain map. So it's a very important thing that we, that we use both uh, mined data, but also uh, uh, proprietary customer data, company data, to make sure that we know exactly what is coming from where. Uh, we have a few projects ongoing uh, with the public sector. Uh, we are involved in the Global Identifier Pilot through our customers. We are working with the Department of Labor on data structures for traceability to prevent child labor uh, together with Verite on the Streams project. And I'd like to propose to you today that source map, since it's such a powerful tool for collecting very large uh, and complex supply chain maps and all of the supporting information, that it be considered as a case management solution to really cut down on a lot of the work that uh, CBP is doing and other government agencies to map supply chains using PowerPoint or Excel. And then last but not least, um, supply chain transparency isn't just good for compliance and to keep forced labor out of the U.S. Uh, it's not just good for resilience and making sure supply chains can continue to operate. It's also good for all of us. And, and you'll see brands more and more actually making their supply chains transparent to the general public to build trust with consumers. So this is not just avoiding risk, it's actually creating value and building trust. And with that, uh, we're happy to take your questions and also uh, show you a demo at our table in the back. Oh, and scan the barcode. Hey. Hi. Um, auditability of the what gets into source map. How are you auditing and confirming that the information is accurate? And are you sending auditors out, or are you relying on technology to do that? Absolutely. Uh, so the auditability of the data is is the reason for the supply chain mapping. So we're creating a, an audit trail uh, for every U.S. bound container through this process. The Verification happens essentially in two ways. There's uh, inward looking. We look for the coherence of the data, and we look to make sure that every transaction is accounted for so that there are no volumes lost or gained along the chain of custody from raw material to, to import. And then it happens through third-party referencing, and that's looking up databases like the Caron databases, risk heat maps, entities lists, sanctions lists, and the like to make sure that uh, neither the suppliers that have been mapped nor any of their uh, affiliated suppliers are appearing on any high-risk maps. Great. Oh. Hello, Maria Stoyanova from STS. You mentioned supply outreach. and. I'm interested to hear a little bit more on how do you motivate, especially the upper tier suppliers, to, to basically fill out the information that you're looking for, supply the documentation when this is probably very sensitive information that they will be supplying to you, and the end client is a few tiers removed. I'm very interested in that. Yeah. Thank you. So the question is how do we motivate suppliers to provide data? Uh, it's, it's a good question, and it's gotten a lot easier uh, in the last three years, I can tell you that much. Uh, suppliers are primarily motivated by commercial interests, so they're motivated because the largest brands in the U.S. are requiring supply chain transparency in order to do business with, with foreign suppliers. And so having it now become part of uh, CBP uh, compliance uh, is extremely motivating to uh, overseas suppliers who increasingly have already mapped their supply chains and have the data available to share. So like I said, in the food and apparel and luxury industries, the, the majority of, of tier one suppliers already have data available to share uh, because this has been uh, ongoing for, for more than a decade now. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, things at play here. Uh, since many suppliers already provide transparency, that provides a competitive advantage for those suppliers and a significant competitive disadvantage for companies that don't have the traceability yet. So what has started to happen is a virtuous circle where suppliers are competing on the basis of being transparent. And so as I showed you the slide with the different brands that are using supply chain transparency in a, in a marketing way, in a brand building way, uh, suppliers are doing the same. They're using supply chain transparency to sell more premium uh, goods on, onto premium markets, especially the North American ones. So we think of supply chain transparency as a very 
small price to pay for access to, to the U.S. market. And then last but not least, um, the biggest outlier group who are unable to provide transparency actually don't have the data or the technology. And so what our outreach team does is identify anywhere that enabling technology needs to be offered. And I forgot to say, you know, for suppliers to use SourceMap is completely free. So small, medium enterprises, smallholder farmers in West Africa, Indonesia use SourceMap every day uh, because it's free and because it is a tool that they can use in and of itself to map their farms to upload their transactions. And so we, we've worked very closely with our customers to provide that enabling technology, and that could go, we had recently a, a hazelnut farmer in Turkey that you know, couldn't log in, and our outreach team was able to track down the farmer's son, and the son had an internet connection and was able to help his dad get online and upload the information. So um, if the commercial incentive isn't enough, more often than not, it's the lack of access to technology, and we have the experience to bridge that gap. Great, thank you. So we have a, a, a really kind of amazing problem that I don't usually encounter, which is that we're, we're running a little bit early. Um, so what we're thinking is that instead of waiting and starting at 2.45 for the next session, we'll take a quick break now and get started at 2.15. So let's come back here, convene at 2.15, and, and we can let you go a little bit early today. Thanks a lot. See you in a few minutes.